and say, Rob, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thanks for having me, Jeremy. This is absolutely fantastic. I've been a listener of the show for a long time, so it, uh, it's both a thrill and an honor to be on the show myself. The honor is mine, because you did something, and, and listeners, you may notice that this is kind of starting out like an interview show, and you might, if you're listening to it right off the bat when it's released, you might be saying, wait a second, this is coming out on a Thursday, not a Monday. Why is an interview coming out on a Thursday? Or maybe you don't pay that much attention, but I'm sure there are some of you out there asking that question. And really, as much as we're going to talk about Sensei Rob and what he's got going on, there was something really specific that he did that caught my eye that I wanted to bring him on to talk about because I thought it was really cool. And without jumping into anything else, because I think this is the best place to start it off, you undertook. I don't know what we call it, a, a an undertaking that you titled 30 Days of Karate. That's right. So I witnessed it as posts on Instagram. But I know it was a lot more than you taking a single photo a day or, or something like that. There was actually a lot of substance behind it. So I just kind of want to step back from the mic now and let you explain to the listeners what you did and more importantly, why. Absolutely. So... This was actually my my second go around, the first time I tagged you. And I think when when you said I did something that caught your eye, I think what I did was probably tag you in, in a post to begin with. And it was one of your earlier episodes um, that got me thinking about journeys and, and struggling and, and pushing and, and stuff, which you often do. And so I thought, OK, well, now this time around, I'm I'm going to tag you in, in the 30 days of karate. And, and you're right. I'm not sure what to call it either. Maybe a, a personal mission or, or a personal discipline. Growing up, I've been someone who I, I get hooked by something and then I jump in both feet and I really get into it. And then after a while, the, the excitement can start to wane a little bit. So not that that was happening with karate, but I was kind of finding myself popping into a recognizable pattern. I thought, well, that's not the way for me to grow. So last oh, April, I guess, um, just coming up, what, seven or eight months ago, I was out in my backyard practicing. I thought, no, I, I should do this tomorrow as well. Next thing I knew, I kind of grew this 30 days of, of karate. And then uh, that ended up really being an excellent uh, exercise for me. Got me kind of disciplined, kind of rekindled some of that, that fire. I finished it, and I thought, well, no, I need to do that again. And that's going to be, you know, I'm not sure when. I thought, well, six, a six-month period wouldn't be a good time. So September came around. I thought, okay, 30 days in September, 30 days of karate, that, that's a good match. Away I go. But what was really neat this time was um, I was talking with one of my my adult students in, in one of my classes and another person who I'd, I've never met them in person, but I've become friends with them on Instagram through martial arts uh, posts and stuff. And the two of them joined me and uh, they did the 30 days of karate alongside me. And that was just fantastic because now I had someone, actually two people who I felt accountable to for making sure that I completed all 30 days and, and they felt the same way. So. What I decided this time around was to um, let it kind of grow organically. Uh, I wasn't going to really structure it. All I knew was I needed to do 30 days, and my goal was to do an hour a day of, of karate. And some days that's really easy because I'm in the dojo for a couple hours. Other days, um, it's been four or five days. I've spent a long, long week at work. I'm tired. I put the kids to bed. It's 10 o'clock, and oh, man, I haven't done my karate yet. And so I'd, I'd either do some meditation, I would do some reading, I would do some kata in the, in the backyard. And the great thing about doing kata at 11 o'clock at night when, when it's dark out is the likelihood of your neighbors wondering what you're doing and calling the police is really low. So all that kind of came together and I said, all right, so here's that's the second iteration of 30 days of karate. And that's the one that I had tagged you in because, again, a lot of the stuff that I've been hearing recently on your podcast really ties into my own philosophy and and my own approach to martial arts. And it seemed like a, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And thankfully you responded and that's why I'm here today. And we're going to talk more about the, the 30 days, but that's, that's the, the history of, of it. Okay, cool. And that's quite an undertaking. I mean, really, and, and that's, that's the word that's, that's coming up because it, it's, I don't want to call it a challenge because as you said, you weren't structuring it, but in a sense, it was a challenge for the logistical reasons for life getting in the way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly what you're talking about, looking at the clock and saying it's 10 o'clock. I've got two hours left in my day to get one hour of practice in. That doesn't leave a lot of variability. No. It, it kind of <laughs> becomes, I, I have to do that right now. 
Well, and you know, in the interest of uh, transparency, uh, I have to say sometimes, like I said, I'd had that long day at work, plus I'd put the kids down to bed. I was really looking forward to a glass of bourbon. And I just would have to tell myself, no bourbon until I'm done my karate. And that that helped incentivize it some days. <laughs> well, I can certainly empathize with that. Single malt would be my poison, but I get it. Yep. I get it. Now, when you were doing these 30 hours of karate, obviously you mentioned some of them were in the dojo working with your students. And we can probably get a sense as to what those hours look like. But the hours where you were at home or training on your own, you know, outside of class. What did that time look like? What were you doing? Mm -hmm. Sure. First of all, I have to say like, wow, I, no one had ever has ever stopped to say, so those 30 hours of karate you did in September, like, wow, and I've never thought of it. It was like the, the uh, totality of the number. And I think I just got hit with the, the uh, enormity of, of, of the challenge. So anyway, um, it really varied. And that's this again, the second time around, I really needed to make sure that I could vary it a bit. I tried to incorporate some meditation every single day because that I found has been key to kind of allow myself to center and focus and and move away in, in my brain from the everyday into focusing on on uh, karate. I also really, uh, a couple of years ago, that's when I really discovered, and this should make your, your heart swell, I really discovered the joy of kata. Uh, before I then caught up with one of those necessary evils that I had to do, uh, a couple years ago, it, something clicked. And I thought, okay, so this time I'm going to practice. And in our school, we use the uh, Pinon High End system. And I just went with the first one. And I just, that's one that I practiced over and over and over. Because I remember reading somewhere, um, you know, the old masters would talk about three years of kata. I thought, well, if if three years of kata before I can call myself a master, I did, you know, doing it several times a day for 30 days isn't is going to get me closer, but certainly isn't going to make me master it. So I, I try to focus on that. And again, that was part of the challenge and part of the discipline to say, you know, I'm really don't feel like doing kata tonight, but that's part of the, um, part of the decision I've made part of the challenge I've given myself. Plus, you know, I, sometimes I just had to say to myself, it's only 30 days and the challenge was, you know, 30 days is long, but it's, it's long enough that it's a challenge, but it's not so long that you just feel um, like there's no end to it. So that's a lot of it, a lot of kata. I also incorporate a lot more of my Kabodo training. So I, my first love are, are, are the Tanfa and, uh, and the Joe. So years ago I used to do Aikido and that's where, where I fell in love with the short staff, the Joe. And, uh, Kabuto was almost my, it was almost my, my treat, my reward for doing the, the kata. And a lot of times just basics. Um, Iron shot bag. So I was, some days I I would do some hojo undo, um, really kind of strengthening um, my bones. And let me tell you, iron shot bags they hurt. And, and I kept thinking, oh, I did. It's like, oh man, this really really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's supposed to be really good for me. And I hope it stops hurting. Then I realize at some point I'm not trying to destroy the nerves in my hand. I'm trying to uh, you know reinforce the bone structure. So. I suppose it's never going to stop hurting. And that's, again, that's part of the discipline, part of the challenge. So it really, when I say that I, I changed up a lot, I, I'd say the only thing that really stayed constant throughout the, the entire 30 days was um, kata practice and meditation. But I, I also, this one wanted to free myself up to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going for, for an hour. If today I can only do 30 minutes and the last 30 minutes starts to just slide and become sloppy, I'm not doing myself any favors by forcing myself through 30 minutes of, of bad practice. So you just have to forgive yourself, move on to the next day. And I knew that there'd be days where I'd be spending two and a half, three hours in the dojo. And I, I would make that time up. So it was a combination of challenging myself and, and disciplining myself to, to do it every day, but also being free to say, you know what? 30 minutes is enough today. And I, I just, for whatever reason, any, any more. And it's, It'll actually be a negative experience, and that, that's not helpful. You've alluded to some of the emotional things that were happening mm -hmm. during this, you know, the pain and, and maybe a little bit of foreboding as you looked into training later into the evening and certainly some more positive things. Were there any themes, you know, um, I guess in, in the emotional response to doing this was... You know, did it start out all hunky-dory and in the middle, did it really stink? And at the end, you were glad it was over? I mean, was there a, a path like that or was it more disjointed? 
you know what? A little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, to be perfectly honest. The hardest part for me was days seven through 10. The first week is easy because you're you're selling that high of just doing it and you're excited by it. You've done seven days. It's going great. And you hit a, a bit of a wall at day eight because you've been doing it for a week now. You're not even close to halfway. You're not even halfway to halfway yet, right? And so it that's days eight through 10 to 11. Those are the toughest for me. Once I got onto day 12, it's like, okay, you know what? Halfway is only a couple of days away. I got this. And then once I hit day 15, I was able to go. And because now, now it's a countdown, right? 15, 14, 13, and so forth. I was, I was happy that I finished it. I was happy that I finished it successfully. Part of it, though, it, it was hard to let go. On day 31, I also know that I needed to not do anything that day. I knew that I needed to take a break. Okay, I've done 30 days. I've done these 30 hours. It's okay to take, okay to take a break and, and rest and, and relax and give my, my body a, a bit of a break. So there's kind of the finishing was bittersweet is probably the best way to put it. But, you know, I also don't want to leave anybody with the impression that having, you know, several nights going late, 11 o'clock. And there are a couple of times where I was outside midnight. And this great thing here in uh, Chicagoland in September, if it's Friday or Saturday night, midnight, it it was like 68 degrees, 67. It was just beautiful outside. So I, I didn't mind. And again, busy day. My kids were in soccer. So we had to rush them around to games and spending time with them, spending time with my wife. And so it wasn't necessarily a, a tough thing to stay up every single night and do. Sometimes that was something I looked forward to. And there were a couple of times, I'll be honest, where I actually planned my day that I wasn't going to go out until 11 o'clock at night or even later because that's my time. That's me time. And yeah, sometimes it was tough. Sometimes there was pain from, from some of the training. But it really... Um, it really provided a way for me to kind of get an insight into how I view my karate, how I view martial arts, my dedication to it. The fact that I look for me time. So training karate isn't time away from kind of me and myself and, but rather that's where I find myself. So it was overall a very positive experience. Again, come April, I'll do it again. Um, hopefully you know, hopefully uh, some of your listeners will will want to join me. There's you know nothing to it other than you know just post on Instagram every day a picture and it says tag it thirty days of karate and you know and hopefully we'll get a little community just doing this kind of thing twice a year. So again, it's a positive experience. There were certain days that were tough, and like I said, you know, days eight through ten, eleven were were tough. But again, overall, um, it was something that I had to look forward to as well. Nice. And certainly, I think we'll have some folks from this community join you. I have every intention of joining you. I think it's fantastic what you've done. And listeners, we'll make sure that we remind you a few weeks in advance. And I'm going to ask Sensei Rob to help remind me to remind you a few weeks in advance so we can promote it. And maybe, you know, I don't certainly don't want to co-opt it as a martial arts radio thing. This is a thing that you started and you deserve the credit for that. But if it's something that we can encourage others to do and Others can receive some benefit from it and some mutual support, leaning on each other and posting and sharing hashtags. Then exactly. Yeah. And you know what? And if it morphs from 30 days of karate into 30 days of martial arts, that's even better. Right. It's 30 days of karate for me because that's my art. That's what I study. But I tell you, if there's someone doing Wing Chun or uh, Aikido and they want to join, that, that'd be great. Cool. Awesome. When you look back over mm -hmm. these two instances of 30 days, what has changed for you? Oh, wow. Great question. And I'm, I'm trying to, th I'm trying to think without leaving a lot of dead air for you. Um, probably the biggest thing that has changed has been probably my, my temperament. Um, you know, there were times when having to go to the dojo really did feel like a burden. Not not a big one, but just like, oh, you know what? It's been a long day. I'd rather just take tonight off. But again, knowing that I, I could do that 30 days challenge, knowing that when push came to shove, I could reach down, find that energy, grab it, and go. That really helped. And again, it the whole experience kind of re-sparked that, that energy and, and that excitement for, for the martial arts. 
And again, the meditation. So I, I really wanted to balance things out. So the use of the meditation is something that I've continued every day as, as well. And sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's half an hour, sometimes it's like two minutes. Um, but that's, I think, probably my biggest takeaway is that I, I know what I'm capable of. Or at least I'm getting a better sense of what I'm capable of. And I know how to recenter and refocus fairly quickly if I feel the need to. If someone's listening and they're, they're all inspired, you know, you've got them excited about this idea, but they don't want to wait for April to do it with others. They want to do it on their own. What advice might you have for them? Go for it. You know, if I, you know, presumably if, if people listening to the show, this is not their only form of, um, on social media, they're probably going to be on Facebook. They'll be, well, obviously they're on Facebook because they'll be following the podcast on, on Facebook too, right? Hopefully. Um, and of course, they'll be following uh, Whistle Kick Radio on, on Instagram. So, you know, get on there and reach out. You know, it's easy when you, when you start participating in some of the online forums and Facebook groups, it's really easy to get discouraged by some of the, you know, keyboard warriors who just want to, um, you know, troll and, and hate on anything you do. But there's a lot of us out there who want nothing more than to help and support each other, right? It doesn't matter if, again, you know, my, my first art that I uh, studied was Aikido, but I, I mean, I love Kung Fu. I love Wing Chun. Any really good martial art I love, and anyone who's practicing it and who's dedicated to it, man, I would love to talk to those people. So go for it. If, if you think it might be good, if you're not sure you can do 30 days, try 10, right? Try 20. And and reach out. Just say, hey, so I listened to the podcast. Sounds like a good idea. I'm not going to wait till April. So I'm going to start right now. I'm going to do 10 days. You know, hashtag it. Throw it out there. Reach out. Because the people who listen to your show and uh, others like it um, are typically going to be the kind of people who will respond to someone saying, hey, I need some support. Would you mind helping me out? Yeah. One of the most beautiful things about the internet, about what this fantastic communication medium has done for the martial arts is it's broken down a lot of those barriers, whether it's geographic barriers or, you know, confining arts to, you know, to, to certain people to, to hide the knowledge, you know, however you want to look at it, those barriers have fallen. And there are so many of us doing so many different things in different ways, yet for a lot of the same reasons The mo my motivation with this show and with whistle kick, is pretty much spot on to your motivation for 30 days of karate. We're doing it because of a passion for martial arts and trying to help ourselves and to help others with it. And, you know, that's not the first time you've said that on, on your podcast either. And that's one of the things that has attracted me and it keeps me coming back to li listen to your episodes over and over. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> I promise this was not the, the price to entry. I did not give him a list of, of compliments that he had to throw my way by the end of the show. No, but I do have a whole list written down that I want to throw by, by the end of the show. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, I'll take them. I'll take them. Of course, we're going to link, you know, the hashtag that you used and your social media at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com under your episode. But for folks that, you know, maybe aren't going to make it over there, can you throw out, what's your Instagram handle? It sounds like that's the primary for you. It is. Um, it's dad ain't hip. And that is, um, it's dad, I have to look, underscore ain't, underscore hip. And that comes courtesy of my, well, at the time, my seven-year-old son who kindly pointed out to me how I was no longer cool. <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, come on, man. I'm, I study karate. I, I'm in IT. I drive a minivan. What, what's not cool about me? But, uh, so yeah, I, I figured, well, the best way to show just how cool I'm not was to change the word cool to hip. Cause he, when I said, Oh, so I'm not hip. And he's like, what does hip mean? So, yeah. You think, thanks for proving my point kid. So yeah, dad underscore ain't underscore hip on Instagram. Is... There we go. And you are an, yet another martial artist involved in it. Oh yeah. Th there's, we have, we have to be, I mean, otherwise we are like the wounded gazelles on the Serengeti, right? We have to protect ourselves. <laughs> Maybe that's it. There, there's, there's a correlation because it, it's so many. There are so many of us, and, and folks that might be new to the show may may not know. I've mentioned it before, but my my previous career prior to Whistlekick, uh, I had an IT consulting firm. So there's a bunch of us. There's a lot. 
There are, and I, th- I think they at least one of the two guys. If you don't mind me mentioning another podcast on, no, on your show, yeah. uh, the two two guys who do Karate Cafe. I know at least one of them is in, in, in IT at, at the same time. So it, we're, it's not a it's not a strange mixture. No, it's, it's pretty common. No, there, there's something in the mindset for the two. I'm telling, that is, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's self it's self preservation. That's what it's got to be. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, I do want to get one little bit, you know, just kind of kind of roll back. And ask that very first question that we ask of everyone when they come on for our standard Monday show about how you got started in the martial arts. I think that'll likely tie us up in a nice way. Absolutely. So I started martial arts so 25 years and probably 100 pounds ago when I was in my early 20s. I'd, ever since I was a teenager, you know, I, I grew up watching um, Bruce Lee movies, Jean-Claude Van Damme and um a little bit later on, Steven Seagal movies, and that always looked cool to me. And especially, again, not not that I was an outcast, but I was certainly kind of a nerdy guy in, in junior high school and high school. And a lot of the characters in martial arts movies, the the hero is a bit of a, a social social outcast, or at least socially awkward. So I kind of related to the characters, and I idolized kind of how they ended up you know, coming out, out on top that, well, that's really cool. And they also, you know, the one, the one thing that they all, all these characters have in common, of course, is study martial arts. So that, well, that, that, that's really cool. Um, and then, oh, like I said, I'd, I'd wanted to and wanted to. And finally is when I was, uh, in university that I had the opportunity to sign up for something through, through the university. And I've also been the guy usually who's attracted to the less than common items. So, you know, they're offering karate. They're offering several, and they offer this thing, and I'd never heard of it at the time. Aikido. I thought, well, that's kind of cool. So I looked it up quickly, and thought, oh, I'll, I'll try Aikido. Why not? And I fell in love with it. And it was great. I, my flexibility was never as, as good as it was when I was doing that. It offered the discipline that I was looking for, and I think a lot of us um, in, in the martial arts, I think a lot of us look for ritual in our lives because that's kind of lost. I think in, in our day to day lives. I'm, you know. I'm also a cigar guy. I like good wines. Not that I can afford to buy them all the time, but there's something to the to the opening a, and pouring a bottle of wine. There's something to cutting and lighting a cigar. There's something to pouring a really good single malt or, or other whiskey over, you know, a perfectly formed ice cube. There's a ritual involved. And when it comes to martial arts, I think that's at least for me. And I know several people I've talked to. One of the big things that we look for is some kind of ritual to bring back in our lives. And Aikido had that discipline and that ritual. Um, and then, so I, I fell in love with it and did it for about a year until I realized that being a full-time student really didn't provide me with the budget to uh, to continue. And so for years, I was really, I mean, I'd, I'd watch, I continue to watch movies, um, but at this point, uh, the web had finally come around and YouTube was starting to grow and I was able to watch videos online of people actually doing it, not just, you know, actors and always want to get back, always want to get back. And then when our son was born, it was very apparent that not only was my son going to be following in my steps of, of nerdism, but he was going to take it to the next level. So I thought, well, you know, let's get him started early. And we signed him up for a different art. And that one didn't work out too well. So my wife found this group through the local park district. And I thought, well, I don't man, you know, karate is kind of a mainstream thing. And it's done through the park district. How good can it be? But you know what? He's sick. So if it gets him out running around for half an hour, 45 minutes, once a week, get him some exercise, whatever. We'll sign him up. Took him to the first day. And I, th- I was amazed. The, the two instructors at the time, both of whom had become friends of mine since, uh, Sensei Joe and Sensei Ken had this wonderful ability to balance the need to keep the kids disciplined and focused and, and training without ever letting them not be kids. And I remember the first time I walked in and the kids were running around, like crazy and all of a sudden sensei joe yells out for the kids to get in line they like snap into attention they run they get in line they get into a, a nice formal stance and thought wow that's that's pretty cool I, you know wonder if you can teach me to do that and wonder if you can come home and do it for me at, at home because my son didn't respond to me like that and it turns out that they had a parent program and um the with the parents program it was you train alongside your kids you you test everything um 
there's an extra class for the kids. And, and as a parent, it was free. I just would have to help out in class once in a while and holding bags, hurting the cats and so forth. And I guess maybe that was about six years ago, five years ago now, I guess. And um, I was not expecting. Actually, it's not even fair to say that I wasn't expecting to get bit by the karate bug. I was fully expecting not to get bit by the karate bug. It's something that my son would do. But within one or two classes, and I told my son, look, you make your orange belt, your, your your second belt, and I will join as a parent helper. Part of this was I need my son to stick with something. You know, it's not we're going to do karate for one, you know, one uh, season and then you're done and try something else or you're going to stick with something. And if you want me to do this parent program, you have to make at least your, 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 um, your second grade. So he did. I said, all right, well, here's the deal. And I joined up and God, that was quite a while ago. And now um, I run two of the locations and along with some other really fantastic senseis. And, and I haven't looked back, but like I said, I really was not expecting to fall in love with karate like I did. Awesome. That's such a great story. And there are so many out there who started because of their children. My mother started because she was tired of just watching me from the side and I've talked to plenty of others who have had the same experience and seeing it now, friends, peers of mine, people my age, watching their kids get old enough and they start and say, okay, it's time for me to jump into. But it's, it's great that there's an actual structure to weave parents in at your school. And I'm wondering if you might just tell us a little bit more about what that looks like, because I, I bet we have some interest peaked in the listeners. Oh, yeah. And again, if anybody's interested in, in starting up a program like this for their school, I um, can't reach out on, on Instagram. I'd be, be happy to talk about it. We're, we're proud of, of this. Um, each class, because of the age of the kids, is about 45 minutes in length, because that's really for kids who are six and seven and eight. That's about as long as you can really keep their attention and keep their focus going, it's especially at, at the uh, younger uh, ranks. So with the parent helpers, you know, sometimes I I just need someone to hold shield. Sometimes I need to help keep the kids in line while they're lining up to do something. But what's great is after a while, after this program, I've got um, one of my classes. I've got uh, like six parent helpers in in the program for about thirty kids. So quite often I'm and I have other uh, black belts who are instructors in the class. So there are times when I get to. Uh, and this is a real treat for me. I mean, as much as I love training the kids, there are times when I get to say to the parents, look, the other instructors, they got the kids. The kids are in great shape tonight. I'm going to take you guys off to the side and we're going to train and we train a little bit harder and we go a little bit faster. But the really great thing about the program is that it gives the parent or parents an opportunity to, to spend some time with their kids. I mean, how often especially today, right? And I see it all the time with friends of mine who have kids. You sign your kids up for soccer in, in the spring and, and the fall. You sign them up for uh, uh, baseball in the summer. You sign them up for some kind of maybe basketball over the winter. And you will go to the practices. You will go to the games. You'll watch and you'll encourage and do everything you, you should be doing. But you become a spectator in the development of your kids. Whereas karate is an opportunity to actually engage at the same level. So it's not that your your son or daughter is going to come home and say, hey, dad, I learned, I learned how to do a, a proper punch today. You know, your child's going to go home and say to his mom or, or dad and say, hey, we learned how to do a proper punch today. So you're doing it alongside your child. And even for adults, there's still a lot of personal development and a lot of personal growth that happens and an opportunity for that. And why why not do it alongside while while your child is doing that? So it, it's it's an amazing experience to to be able to do martial arts alongside your kids. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes we separate the parents and we can do some stuff that we we wouldn't do with the kids. But most of the time, they're they're right there. And um, the other great thing, anecdotally, I can tell you is that when kids have a parent in the program doing it at the same time, the likelihood of them staying much longer in the program. You know, because we all know, right, it's for every 100 white belts, one of them is going to test for black. Chances are, in our program, that one who tests for black probably has a parent who's going alongside them in the program as well. And of course, anybody that's spent time in a mixed age class knows that the adults tend to bring up the focus and the the, uh, the resolve of the children. And the children tend to teach the adults how to have a bit more fun. And yeah. Be silly. 
Well, you know, the and the fun thing too is we like to incorporate games a lot in inner classes because you got again got to keep the kids laughing and having a good time. They have to want to come back to karate, right? Especially you know again any other sport, soccer, football, baseball. Those are short seasons. Whereas when you're in karate, it's every week and until you decide to stop and that's you know 52 weeks a year so you have to keep them engaged and you have to make them want to come back and we do we do that with games and my one rule when we play games in class well two rules number one is you know the game has to have something to do with building some kind of skill whether it's just helping with their um, agility or focus or awareness whatever but my other rule is the parents don't get to stand on the sidelines if you're in my class if you're a parent helper in the class and, and you're taking karate alongside you're playing the game too. So sometimes we play, we call it dodge pad. So we don't play dodgeball, but we'll take, we'll take sparring pads and we'll, we'll play dodge pad. Um, and sometimes we'll do parents against the kids. And by the way, the kids invariably win that one <laughs> because the parents are like, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm a little too big. I'm a little too old to like suddenly reach out and try and grab a pad. And, and you know, kids have no sense of, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but you know they're they're just going to go in there, grab that pad, and just start hurling at, at their yeah. parents, and, and and the ability to throw something at, at their parents and not get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, it's it's a great opportunity. And again, if anybody has any uh, sense of wanting to incorporate a parent program, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We're again, we're proud of that. It's it's a big part of our program, and I think every school would benefit from from having some kind of program like that. Wonderful. Well, folks, there are two wonderful reasons to follow Sensei Rob on Instagram, to reach out to him. If you're driving or something where you can't jot down his Instagram handle, dad underscore ain't underscore hip, which <laughs> is probably in my top five or favorite social media handles <laughs> okay. of all time. Uh, you can you can find the link to that over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll link it up for you so you can go right there. But He's on the show for a reason. You know, he, he he wants to share this stuff and he wants you all to join him to reach out. And of course, we will let you all know as April approaches 30 days of karate. We can twist it into 30 days of martial arts for those of you that, that don't practice karate. And we can all work on this together and, and become better and lean on each other and discover these lessons together. Sensei Rob, I really appreciate you coming on today and thanks for sharing and, and just doing oh, what thank- you do. Oh, thanks so much. Because again, you know, I've been listening to your show for a long time and knowing just the, um, you know, some of the guests that you've had, I have to say, you know, me being on your show feels like I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. And, and it's like I said, it's been, been a thrill. 